Welcome to the car guys and welcome to a special road trip episode with my Lotus 240 Final Edition. I'm going to be going on a 650 mile road trip, first of all here to the Lotus factory to get the car serviced for the first time and then I'm on to Chatsworth House and then all the way back to Car Guys HQ. So it will be a real test of this car's abilities and I'm hoping it'll answer the question, do I finally gel with this car? Is it a keeper for the Car Guys garage? This is going to be more miles in one continuous segment than I've ever done in this car. So if there's ever going to be a time to find out what I like and dislike about actually driving it, the usability and the overall experience and whether I've made the right decision even buying this car, this is it. Now the first stage of this journey, which is Southampton to Hethel, the Lotus factory, is a little over 200 miles. And on British roads, that's gonna take me at least three and a half hours. And I have to confess that I am not really looking forward to spending that amount of time in a car like this. Remember, this is very small, it's quite bumpy, it's quite fidgety, the seating position is quite upright, the steering is fixed ahead of me, and it's quite a frenetic drive, frankly. It's going to be a bit of a backbreaker. As Clarkson once said, I'm mad for doing this, and obviously there's not a lot of room in this thing, so if you are going on a road trip, you've got to pack light, or you've got to utilize the passenger seat, as I've done here. So I'm pretty much packed to the gills in this thing. And I'm only going away two days. But at the end of this trip, the car will have had its first run in service. I will be at full revs and I will have had an epic road trip in a car that up until now, I've not had that much love for. So I think despite the physical torture, this could well be a great couple of days. Now, full disclosure, I think Lotus wanted to, in some way, ensure that perhaps the original experience that I missed out on with this car was rectified. So, they did suggest that it would be a good idea for me to take the car to the factory and to perhaps have a little bit of fun while I'm there, which obviously I was up for. Remember, the whole reason why I wanted to buy this car and enjoy it is so that I could A, say that I'd owned a Lotus at one point in my life, but also because I have a huge respect and love for its history and for its previous cars. And that hasn't diminished, despite the problems picking up this car and in the delivery of it, that hasn't diminished. Some things to contend with on this trip, it has been snowing in the north of the country and to the Midlands. And given that I'm going to the Midlands, there could well be some snow on this trip. I'm not sure a Lotus Elise is gonna handle the snow that well. And there's a good chance that you will experience pretty much all the seasons that Britain has to offer. It's gonna be cloudy, it's gonna be sunny, it's gonna be rainy, and it's gonna be snowy. It's the Grand Slam. But for now, it's time to put some serious miles on this car and close the gap to the Hethel Lotus factory as quickly as I can before my back gives out. So I'm about an hour into the journey and I'm on the motorway now, which is not the natural habitat for the Lotus Elise. One thing I can tell you immediately is it will follow tram lines that have been left by lorries very closely. So you have quite a few scary, twitchy moments where suddenly the car will lock into a set of rails and it gives it a kind of shimmy, which is not really what you want, but it's as a result of those sort of thinner tires and the lightness of the car overall. You really do notice how small this car is when you're on the motorway and you are surrounded by enormous HGVs who may or may not see you. So a few months in, what are the things that I really like about this Lotus Elise? Well, it's an enduring classic 25 year old shape and that can't help but raise a smile every time you walk out to look at it in the garage. 
I actually really like the fact that I chose to have carbon sills. They are huge, so you do get to look at them a lot, and it's always nice to look at polished carbon. But one added benefit is that they're so wide that when you're stopped, you can use them as quite an effective shelf, particularly for drinks and food. I like the fact that it's minimalist and stripped out. I like this aluminium half tube that you can put knickknacks and things in while you're driving. I really like the air conditioning and the heating controls. I think they're pretty cool. And obviously because it's the 240 final edition, you get a decent amount of power. Not a huge amount. The shove is there, but it is not Titanic. And let's face it, a GR Yaris would walk all over this car in any condition. The steering is alive in your hands, extremely direct, and you can feel everything that's going on through the seat, because essentially I'm riding what feels like about five millimeters above the road. I am a big fan of the gear change though. It is mechanical. It's obviously open to the elements, so you can see it all. A few people have wondered what happens if you accidentally drop things in there, and I'm not sure I know the answer to that. But it's certainly very satisfying to drive this manual sticked car, although the numbers on the ball are a little bit rough, resulting in some torn skin. Having driven it for now nearly a thousand miles, obviously some niggles do come out. I don't find the brakes particularly confidence inspiring. There's a lot of pedal travel and it doesn't feel tremendous stopping power, which is a bit of a worry. Obviously it's a light car, so you don't need as much to stop it, but in the times that I've had to do some pretty hefty braking, it's not felt so great. I think some of the interior does feel a little bit cheap and obviously this panel down here does flop open when you go over rough surfaces or you're hard cornering. So that's hopefully going to be fixed uh, by the Lotus guys today. I don't feel that these buttons have a nice feel at all. There's no event pressing the start button of the car and the headlights have a very indistinct feel to them. So you, you really have to sort of push them and you're not really sure if you're actually even pushing the button. You do get that same issue with the sport button. Sometimes you'll press it and nothing happens. You have to keep pressing it and then eventually it decides to turn on the sport mode. You'll notice on these polished carbon sills, there are loads of rubber streaks on them and that's because when I get in the car, very often rubber soles will leave a mark across them, which is a bit annoying. And it is of course a consequence of being such a small entrance to get in this car. Has it given me backache? Well, getting in and out of the car the first month of ownership Yes, it definitely did. I definitely put my back out as a result of getting in and out of it, but I feel a little bit more flexible now, so it's less of a problem. One of the things I really hate, and I know I should probably read the manual and do something about this, is this horrendous Sony stereo system. None of the buttons do what you think. It's all tiny, so you can't tell what's going on. There's no clear way of doing anything. The only clear button on this stereo is extra bass, which literally increases the bass on the stereo. The least important thing in any stereo, but yet that's the most prominent button. Not the on and off, not changing to different bands, not cycling through different inputs, all of those things that you would use a lot more. No, no bass is the thing that is prioritized. There's three things I hate about this radio. Number one, the sensitivity of the volume knob, which is set to ridiculously high, and you just have to brush it, and it goes to full volume, blows your ears out. And obviously, because you're bouncing along in a Lotus Elise, it's quite difficult to turn it without accidentally knocking it. I hate the fact that it's in demo mode as standard, and therefore constantly flashes inane messages at you all the time, taking your eye off the road. 10 preset, 2 pre-out, front USB, iPhone, music, control, digital. It gets so annoying I actually take the faceplate off because I just can't stand it. And the third thing that was annoying is that in no way could I find how to connect up USB or the iPhone to it. Bluetooth, didn't recognize it at all. The socket over on the left hand side, which no human can get his hand in, accepted a USB cable, but it was in no way linked to the stereo. And then a few days ago, I found a tiny sliding panel on the front, which you slide aside and that's where the USB goes. So at least now I've got my iPhone connected to it and I can have music and podcasts and things. But I have to say, out of all the stereos in all the cars that I have, this is the least appropriate for a Lotus Elise. It's the least appropriate for a final edition where it should have something cool and period looking. And it is a horrible user interface that is not a pleasure to use in 100% of circumstances. And I sincerely hope that the Amira 
doesn't have one of these. Other things I'm less than enamoured with, the windscreen wiper feels like it's come off of an Austin England. It is very ineffective. It leaves smears all the time, even from brand new. It in no way clears the windscreen. The top part of the windscreen never gets cleared, so you always are looking through a band of grime, and the bottom section generally is smeared, or it gets cleaned on the first wipe, and then as the wiper goes back, it makes it all smeared again. The AIM digital display I actually quite like. It's a bit too bright contrast at night, and the background is very grey as opposed to jet black. I wish it was jet black so you could really see the definition of the dial. The stalks, of course, are pure voxel, so they work, but they have no style whatsoever. And of course, the big one, I still really hate the colour. I hate it. It is pure 1993 BMW 3 Series. It's just the wrong colour green. Honestly, I'll never ever get used to it. So as you can probably tell from my comments and summary there, the negatives still kind of outweigh the positives of this car. It is not one that I naturally gravitate to. It's not one that I grab the keys to with any relish at the moment, but there are some mitigating factors. Number one, I haven't really driven it balls out in an area where I can do that. So taking it on the Lotus test track today, hopefully will spark some enthusiasm. And also I've not yet taken the roof off because it's been absolutely freezing and the weather's not been right. It took a long time for the temporary roof to arrive from Lotus way after the delivery of the car. And so I haven't been brave enough to uh, get out the old Allen keys and take the roof off and put the temporary roof on it. So those are big provisos. I've not yet had the full open top experience of Lotus and therefore I'm obviously not delivering a full review or final verdict on this car yet until I've had a chance to do a lot of that. I am very excited to see the facility at Hethel, to see all the new bits that have been made and I'm also intrigued to try that test track and see if it's as I remember it for the first time in nearly 25 years. This is the Hatfield Tunnel, so we're about halfway through the journey. We've turned off the M25 and we're now on the A1. Just over an hour to go and I've got the heater cranked up because it's extremely cold outside at the moment. The heating and cooling system in this car is excellent. When you want it to be hot, it's really, really hot. And I guess that's because obviously you would generally have the roof off and you want to be as toasty as possible in here. But also when you want it to be lovely and cool, the air conditioning is fantastic. If anything, the cooling is a bit too good, and it's exacerbated by the fact that the increments between fan positions are far too great. The difference between zero and one on the fan is the equivalent of a hurricane. So if I was gonna suggest one thing to the engineers of the Amira would be to put more increments in there so that you can have a gentle, cool breeze when you want to, rather than having your wig blown off just 30 minutes away now from the Lotus factory. Traffic has been pretty light, the snow has stayed off, the Lotus Elise has been scything through the middle of England. My main physical symptom, having driven for three and a bit hours, is just here. So this is feeling a little bit tense and a little bit uh, tender because obviously I've been gripping the wheel and it's quite an upright driving position. But I have to say it's been a smooth journey. Yes, it's noisy, but I've had Planet Rock turned way up. And I'm looking forward now to taking this car back to where it was built and getting it serviced. So I've turned off all the major roads now and we're on to the little thin twisty bits right up to the Lotus factory. We're within about one and a half miles. Uh, it's a little bit damp, it's quite dark as you can see, but we're about to take this car back to where it was made and uh, I'm pretty excited actually. I'm excited because you've got lots of historic cars at the factory. You've got the factory itself, you've got the new Amira being made at the moment. Uh, and it's going to be my first time really to see the whole setup as it is and how they are gearing up for the future. Oh, I can see the buildings up ahead. This is very exciting. I can see some big industrial structures and literally we are driving right down now past, I think, what is the whole new facility. There's classic Team Lotus there on the right, so that's where they keep all the real historic stuff. And apparently, oh yes, here it is. 
I'm here. I have arrived. Look at that. Look. There's the sign, which looks like it's around here. God, this place is so, so different from when I last saw it. It is massive. Look at it. It's like a proper, proper place. Whereas when I came here before, there was basically one shed over there next to the test track. And yes, here I am. I have arrived at the Lotus factory. So now it's time to get the car booked in and serviced. And then I'm going to hopefully get a tour of the place and maybe a drive around the circuit in something special. So I've just left the Lotus factory. The car is full of petrol. It's been serviced. It's been warmed up by Gavin. Thank you so much, sir. And I'm right behind a mint green BMW Z3, which incidentally enough, I've just been speaking to one of the guys at Lotus about. Weird coincidence or what? So now it's time for the second stage of the Lotus road trip. I'm on my way to Chatsworth House in the Peak District, Peak National Park, and I've got about three and a half hours ahead of me, but the course, the big difference now is the car's been serviced, fully fueled, and I can give it maximum revs. So we're within 21 miles of Chatsworth House. It's been a largely uneventful journey, lots of motorway, but now we've pulled off the motorway onto some fabulous Peak District twisty roads. And this is where the Lotus is gonna come into its own. The great thing now, of course, is that I can use full revs and give it some beans. So how do you fancy that? Ready? Second gear, ready. Oh. Oh yes, oh yeah, I mean it definitely is better. It's, it is glorious to finally use full revs in this car to fully exploit the power, what little there is, and obviously to revel in the sheer fizziness when you do it. This is not a stupendously fast car, we all know that, but it is sufficient to have enormous fun. Well, good morning from a very frosty Chatsworth area. I was at Chatsworth House last night for a watch event, which turned out to be very disappointing. But this morning I'm going to be taking the Lotus, once it's defrosted, down to Stratford-on-Avon to visit my friends at Pragnalls, and then back to the Car Guys HQ. And we should find out once and for all how I feel about this car at the end of an epic 650 miles. So how am I feeling about the Lotus this morning? Well, after 400 odd miles, I have to say, obviously, it is growing on me. I'm feeling a lot more well disposed towards it than I was before. I hadn't really gelled with it, I hadn't really bonded, but now, obviously, we've spent some time together. We've been through a few scrapes. It's very dirty, as you can see. And that special experience at the Lotus factory really did bring it home about how special and how much loved these cars are. Not just by the fans, but also by many of the people that actually build these cars, who buy them as well and enjoy them. Some of the people I met yesterday could not have been more passionate about their Lotuses. It's a beautifully raw, undiluted driving experience. That's the first thing. Steering is very direct, very jiggly. The seats, despite looking insubstantial, are actually quite comfortable, and even though they're upright, you get a bit of pain here, but you soon get used to it. And there is a huge amount of grip, surprisingly huge amount of grip from these tyres. I do prefer the AIM Digital Dash to the conventional one. Having driven in the Series 1, I think definitely that's cemented that for me. The service department has fixed the panel now on my right, so that shouldn't flap open every now and again. And I would even have to say that having seen the Series 1 in the same colour as this, it made me feel a tiny bit better 
about having the car in this colour, but only a tiny bit mind. I think I still would have gone for anything else. One of the biggest downsides in terms of everyday practicality I discovered last night, the headlights are terrible. When you've got them on low beam, it looks like you've got a couple of Victorian lanterns on the front of the car, giving no forward visibility whatsoever. And even on full beam, I'm struggling to see road signs to make sure I was taking the right turning. It's kind of like going back to the dark ages. So Lotus really need to fix that with the Amira if they haven't already. Does it bother me that the yellow on the Lotus logo doesn't match the yellow on the accents inside this car? Yes, it does a bit, to be honest. It doesn't make any sense that you would offer yellow interior highlights and not match them to the same color as the logo. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Maybe that's what's so great about it. Maybe someone at Lotus knows more than I do about color matching, but to me, that's an obvious own goal. There's another thing that's slightly annoying. There's no, um, there's no sun visors when you've got a hard top on, so you get blinded a lot. There is no doubt that modern legislation and driver's preferences have ultimately killed off the Elise. It is a very, very old car. But the great thing about an Elise is that you actually celebrate those imperfections. They're part of what makes the car great. No one will ever build something like this again. It's a great British moment, a point in time where a visionary who wanted lightness to deliver greater performance on track managed to create road cars that are not only memorable but oh so special. I'm now leaving Stratford-on-Avon. I visited Pragnall's Jewelers while I was there to get a quick update on FP Jean watch action. Short update, literally everything is sold out. They haven't got anything there and everything is very hard to get a hold of. So now it's time to head back to the Car Guys HQ. The sun is fully out. We've got some winding, lovely roads ahead and hopefully we'll come to some kind of conclusion with regards how I feel about this car right now after this road trip. So here we are at journey's end, over 650 miles in this road trip and a chance to really get under the skin of this now extremely dirty Lotus Elise 240 Final Edition. What have I learnt? What conclusions have I come to? Well, it's cramped, noisy, bouncy. The windscreen wiper doesn't really work. Compared to my other cars, it doesn't feel that fast. The headlights are rubbish. There's not much storage space. The supplied stereo is horrendous. And of course, in the case of this car, I'm not massively keen on the color. However, on this trip, the grip is incredible. I feel that grip. Look at that. The agility is magnificent. It's got such character. It's peppy, it's gutsy, it's got a great gear change. The responses, the feel through the pedal and the steering wheel is phenomenal. And although it isn't a long distance cruiser, when you get to the right set of roads, there's nothing else quite like it. I finally understand, Lotus people, what you've been on about. This is a superb car, one that I finally gelled with. I understand what you're on about, I understand why They've been selling for 25 years, and I do now finally feel the Lotus love. A large part of that, of course, is the magnificent job that the guys at Lotus did, as well as seeing the production line and the factory, how they're built. All those things truly do fill in the blanks and make you appreciate your new car more. It happened with Ferrari, it happened with Jaguar, and now it's happened with this. So it's been a long couple of days, but they have been exhilarating and I hope you enjoyed coming along for the ride. If you like what we're doing on the car guys, please subscribe, leave comments and likes. There'll be another episode next week.